Red. Red. Are you an aspiring Jedi? Or do you dabble with the dark side of the Force? Regardless of whether you fancy yourself a Defender of the Light or an aspiring Sith Lord, you're going to need a lightsaber. Podcast Stardust is pleased to partner with Saber Masters, the creators of high-quality, durable, and affordable lightsabers. Saber Masters is preparing to launch the Ultimate Lightsaber 2.0, and right now you can get two for the price of one. So, check out the link in our show notes and go get your Ultimate Lightsabers from Saber Masters. And don't forget to use our referral code STARDUST to save $10 at checkout. And each purchase using our referral code helps support Podcast Stardust. Hey, this is Lauren Mary Kim, and I'm the stunt double for Ahsoka Tano in Clone Wars and the armor in The Mandalorian. You're listening to Dennis and Jay on Podcast Stardust. This is the way. Hello and happy Valentine's Day. Welcome to Podcast Stardust. This is the fully armed and operational podcast dedicated to Star Wars news, reviews, and discussion. I'm Dennis Keithley. And I'm Jay Krebs. And this episode features a discussion of an old Legends novel, The Courtship of Princess Leia by Dave Wolverton. But before we get into that, Jay, where can we be found around the internet? All right. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or X these days, at Podcast Artist. All right, this is line. The signal's boosted to maximum output. The shield is down, and we are now broadcasting to the galaxy. So let me say it again. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, Jay. Got any big plans? No, actually, we do not. So we are very low-key for Valentine's Day. and um, But I always like to see what everybody else is up to and what other plans people have. So anything on your end that you guys are doing or you have going on? Uh, no. I mean, you know, you and... Craig had been married for a long time and Beth and I have as well. And at this point, Valentine's Day just doesn't have the novelty to it anymore. But that being said, uh, not to mention, it's just hard to get a table anywhere at a restaurant, whatever, celebrate Valentine's Day. So maybe it's this weekend. Hope we go out and do something. But at the moment, uh, no big plans. But that's not to say we aren't going to celebrate Valentine's Day a little bit on this show. We are going to be taking a look at The Courtship of Princess Leia by Dave Wolverton. This is a classic Star Wars novel. This book was released in April 1994. It doesn't seem like that long. I was thinking maybe in the 90s. That's when I read it for the first time. Do you remember when you read it maybe the first time? Well, mine was a lot later because I know we've had this discussion before about how I kind of went back to a lot of the things in the Expanded Universe, now Legends, um, way, way after the fact. So I ran across this book actually at a used book fair at mm-hmm. our fairgrounds and it was already a very well-loved little paperback and i was like oh the courtship of princess leia what is this you know mm-hmm. so so of course i felt like i had to gobble it up because it was han and leia so i think i read it for the first time mid 2000s somewhere in there um, okay. but i think i've read it like two or three times since then so it's it's one of those that i i always love to go back to if not for the story itself, but for the references that it gives us for our Star Wars life these days, if you will. And, yeah, indeed. I'm, now I'm thinking about it. The first time I read it would have been about 1998. Uh, we had just moved to Dallas with my wife, and she found this book and read it before I did. So uh, nice. I ended up picking it up and reading it after her. So we're reading this as kind of a celebration of Valentine's Day. This is not really a romance when it comes down to it, despite the title, The Courtship of Princess Leia, it is a good old fashioned Star Wars action adventure novel that just happens to have a bit of a rom-com element behind Mm -hmm. with Princess Leia trying Mm -hmm. to decide between two different men. Of course, this book is now part of the Legends line. It's not part of our current continuity. And we've got this story replaced by The Princess and the Scoundrel, which we talked about, was that last year? Or last year before? Yeah, just last year. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I got to tell you, I had a lot of fun reading this. It made me realize 
how much I enjoyed Legends and how much I kind of missed some of those stories. Not all of them were fantastic, but this I thought was a well thought out story and was a lot of fun and a, a good old fashioned Star Wars adventure. Oh, I agree. And there was also kind of that little campy element to it as well, just because you can tell when it was kind of written, you know, not not necessarily the exact year, but you could just tell by the some of the the ways that things were being phrased that you're like, oh, yeah, I could see where some of this humor is coming from or, mm -hmm. you know, where some of this is. But, you know, and one of the other reasons that we're we were doing this of course is because of the whole reappearance of Asajj Ventress and the idea of the Night Sisters and their origins and how they compare and contrast to what we know of the Night Sisters of today but you know there were definitely some things in here that going back and reading it again I thought to myself oh my gosh that is so not like Han you know what I mean it is yeah. but it's a different is and that's the reason why it's legends it's a completely different Han than what we have in canon and that's okay you know mm -hmm. what I mean it's it is a different Leia than what we have in canon in a lot of ways and that's okay they are their own stories and they are their own element and so you kind of have to take them at face value when you're looking at things like that but it, it really is a great adventure when it comes down to it and lays the genetics kind of family tree for the new Jedi order which is definitely my favorite era in all of the the legends other than maybe the Thrawn stuff so yeah so it was it was just great to revisit overall yeah you know the other thing that occurred to me as I was reading this is that as you pointed it's, it's a different type of Han but we also get this adventure that features features Han Luke and Leia yes. right now which we just aren't getting in novels mm -hmm. right now you know everything that happened after Return of the Jedi you have Luke running off on a mission with Lando and then there's some Han and Leia, but and then some Han and Chewbacca, but we don't really get the big three together anymore in mm -hmm. novels and stuff like that. And so getting them off on adventure like this was really pretty cool. And then the other thing that occurred to me is that there just is a tonal difference. And I think this is what you were alluding to between legends and Star Wars novels that have been coming out today. And honestly, while I think the current books that are coming out are more cohesive as a whole. And a lot of them probably are superior stories. I feel like they kind of, this reminds me much more of a George Lucas story than a lot of the other books that we've been getting these days. Doesn't quite have, you know, the, a lot of these novels that we have presently don't quite have the same tone, if that makes any sense. No, it makes total sense. Yes. And and you're right. I mean, it gives you almost a, a different feeling. It's it's um kind of a feel good sort of a thing. And mm -hmm. and I I find myself just having a smile on my face whenever I read a lot of these legends novels just because of that reason. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. And there are different like I said, and I think, you know, part of that is because we do know that and especially now we know that like Luke Han and Leia really aren't going anywhere. I mean, like they're not in any real danger of not surviving to the end of the book right? when it comes down to it, where we know what happens to them now with the sequel trilogy. And, you know, we know what happens to Chewbacca in legends and things like that. And then, so, uh, you know, so that's a counter argument to what I'm just saying, but still just getting this adventure and getting you know, the big three plus the droids plus Chewbacca doing stuff like that was just a lot of fun to go back to that. It, it, I kept thinking of so many different stories while I was reading this and it kept reminding me of all these other things like, and Oh yeah, this character will show up in mm -hmm. that other book is like, you're talking about how it leads into stuff that goes with the new Jedi order. So anyways, I had so much fun uh, rereading this, but let's get into the story just a little bit. So it takes place at eight years after the battle of Yavin. So that would be what, like four years after return of the Jedi mm -hmm. and Han is still a general. In the New Republic, and he's been off kind of on this campaign against uh, the Imperial Warlord Zinja. I, you know, it's funny. Up until I heard uh, January Lavoy do the audio version of this book, I just always pronounced that as Zinj. But Me too. they were clearly saying Zinja in the. Yeah, or Jinja almost. Yeah. yeah, in the audio drama. But he gets back to Coruscant, comes out of hyperspace on the deck of whatever starter story he was on. And there is this Haven fleet and all these other Star Destroyers in orbit. And he immediately goes into, or I may have been a Mon Calamari ship. Anyways, regardless. And he immediately goes into evasive maneuvers, only to realize they're not under attack. Instead, the Havens have shown up 
it is a matriarchal society run by women and their prince wants to marry Leia. And by doing so, Leia would become the next queen of the Hapen Consortium Empire. I'm not sure what I'm going to call it. You know, 63 worlds that they have, and they'd be a great ally to the Republic. And Leia's under a certain amount of pressure to do this. Han gets his jealous streak going and goes gambling and wins the world of Dathomir <laughs> yeah. at the Sabacc table. Essentially kidnaps Leia, takes her off to Dathomir to check out his new world, only to find that it is under Imperial introduction that Zinja's forces are there. Not only that, there are Night Sisters on the planet and their counterparts, the counterparts, the Singy Mountain Clan. By the end of the book, uh, Leia is no longer considering uh, marrying Isolder. She's agrees to marry Han. Uh, Isolder finds a new bride in one of the witches of Dathomir, the sisters of the uh, uh, mountain clan, singing mountain clan. And yeah, everyone heads off on their merry way. So <laughs> as you were very, to. Very good summary. <laughs> yeah. I did the best I could off the top of my head. Let's just dive into it. Did you have a favorite part of this book? Well, you know, what's something I hear that immediately draws you to it? Well, I have to say, I remember reading this book for the first time and thinking, you know, how novel of an idea that this matriarchal society was. And yet we had two different matriarchal societies sort of going head to head when it was all said and done between the the Hapens and the Night Sisters. And then the first time I remember not liking Isolder at all, I, I kind of thought, you know, he was sort of this, this preemptive kind of, you know, entitled prince that thought he was just going to step in and do all of this. And then I came to realize that he's actually a really nice guy, you know, and Han was kind of the jerk through this whole thing for the most part and acting sort of, you know, desperate when it came to winning Leia's hand back. But I just really appreciated the way that like it all ended up centering about around Dathomir, you know, that that Luke was trying to find this records, you know, that all of these things that Dathomir was such a, a mystery. And then all of a sudden now Han owns Dathomir and he's going to take Leia there and try to get her to fall back in love with him seven days and then utilizing some of the the Hapen technology that was what was it the, the gun of persuasion or something like that yeah. that he essentially stuns leia and then kidnaps her which eventually actually ends up saving her life as we find out in the end because the queen of hapes was actually trying to assassinate leia because she wasn't happy with the fact that Isolder chose her to be the next queen she didn't want some pacifist republic person in there to like ruin everything for them but uh, but yeah it was just it was a great little adventure and yet you still got some really saucy kinds of things in there too you know with the with some of these singing mountain clan women uh you know being totally not how do i want to put it they were very open about things let's just put it that right. way not not modest about things and it was all due to the way that their whole hierarchy of their society was and then han as the king of Corellia was just cracking me up you know in the way that that 3po kind of came out with it outed him in public and then also made up that little jingle if you will about han that leia han ends solo. up having what his a man. <laughs> han solo <laughs> little earworm and leia's like why am i singing this in my head um, but yeah, I just, I, I really just appreciated it as a whole, but I really loved how it all ended up with Isolder ending up with Tenennial ten Joe, you know, and then that, yeah. that is like the whole, the whole thing going forward. I just love that. Yeah. So you gave me a lot there that I want to respond to. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. The, uh, the first one being the Hapens and what I thought was fascinating about them is that the whole history of their culture was is that they were descended from pirates. Mm -hmm. There was these pirate gangs that settled on, uh, you know, hapes and they would go out and kidnap like the most beautiful women from all the worlds around them. And then they would leave. And then eventually the women are like, Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> the men keep leaving. What do we need them for? And so the women, you know, basically overthrew them, but they still had this pirate, ancestry 
in there. And so that's how the women came into being in control. And then essentially, you know, the, it's a hereditary title where you know, the queen would pass it down to a daughter, except for in this case, the queen doesn't have a daughter. She's got a son. And so whoever son marries is going to be the new queen of this Capen consortium. And so that's why it's so important. And that's why Tachum uh, did not want Leia because she thought she was too much of a pacifist for, for these, this world. But then you get to hold a mirror up to this. You know, when you're talking about the, the singing mountain clan and the night sisters on Dathmir. That's another matriarchal society. The women are in charge there. So you've got one very technologically advanced society with the Hapens. And then you got one that's far more primitive to use a different word, but you know, they're both run and controlled by women and the Hapens are very cutthroat when it comes down to it. But the singing, the sisters of the singing mountain clan, and I keep wanting to call them Night Sisters, but they're not. The Night Sisters are something very different there. You know, they are very much, you know, they, they have a tribe. They don't, they, and they've got the one queen, unquote, Agwin, I believe is her name. But mm -hmm. they still, like, debate everything. It's almost like a council. It is a bit more democratic when it comes down to it. And so I, I just love that juxtaposition of these two societies here. And right. so, you know, by the end, as you're talking about when I soldier kind of gives up on this idea of marrying Leia, he's fallen in love with Tenennial Joe over the course of the book. And she initially wanted Luke because he was this powerful Jedi and there was a legend of Jedi, but then she comes around to like, I can't have Luke. And she finds also I soldier very attractive to the point where, you know, at one point they're looking off into the night sky and he's showing her where his home world is. And, you know, this is before they know they're going to end up together. She's like, well, you know, when you're on your world, you know, look back here and think of me and I'll be thinking of you. And maybe sometime we'll be thinking of each other at the same time. And so it was a subtle romance that played out over time. And it was a neat way of just kind of combining the two cultures. Oh, for sure. And even Isolder even said, you know, he didn't think she was attractive by Hapen standards, but then ends up thinking that she's beautiful, you know, and mm -hmm. I just thought that was super sweet. And I did appreciate the way that the different subsections of the women of Dathomir were described that the Night Sisters themselves ended up almost this abomination, this malformation of their use of the force, which kind of reminded me a lot of ways in what happened to Palpatine, you know, after yeah. he used the force lightning and he became disformed and disfigured, you know, and all of those things. And it was the dark side that was coursing through them. And Tenennial actually had a little brief run in with that in her desperation, you know, towards the end of the book. And she had that vein that popped out in her face that was purplish and she's like oh my gosh like it's i'm turning into a night sister and how how much it scared her and that actually brings me to another thing about this book that i i really appreciated is the fact of the way that the force was explored and the fact that and, and some of the different force powers too for luke for example to be able to see into other people's heads and to be able to see visions of, you know, their memories and that type of thing that was, I had forgotten, you know, some of these things were able to happen. And then also the way that the women of, for example, the Singing Mountain Clan thought that they had to channel the force through these spells. Mm -hmm. And that realistically, I mean, it was just a different incantation of the force and a different interpretation of the force. And so Luke was able to bring Tenennial Joe kind of around to the idea that the force is something that should be part of your personal light, you know, and mm -hmm. it can calm you and it can do all of these different kinds of things. And the force is life. And eventually the planet actually saves Luke in the end too. And that was, it was just kind of, I really like that because it's different than what we have today, quote unquote, with different force powers. And this is just, it's fun. You know, it was just really fun to see all of those different ways that the force was being used. Yeah. If I have a criticism, and this book doesn't do as bad as a lot of some, some of the other Legends novels is, is that I feel like there isn't enough restraint put on Jedi powers frequently in Legends that they can just get away with doing some really, really crazy things. And some mm -hmm. stories, in fact, just got ruined by the semi-godlike powers that Jedi had. And 
you know, so I'll be honest, you know, sometimes I got kind of turned off, but it, you know, it's just like, how am I going to get this jet out of it? I know create a new force power for yeah. it here. And <laughs> in this case, I kind of felt like the, yeah, Luke had powers that we never saw in the movies that we aren't seeing in the current continuity and stuff like that, but it was manageable for the most part. Mm-hmm. Let's get back to the night sisters for just a second. So of course, in clone wars, we had night sisters that lived on Dathomir. There was no singing mountain clan. It was just the night sisters there. And they seem to be kind of a combination of the night sisters from this book and the singing mountain clan. Yes. They aren't the, you know, brutal dark side masters. They use a force magic, so to speak in the clone wars. But I got to think that the voice work that was done for the night sisters, which has kind of had that reverberation on the voice had to be influenced by like mother Talzin's voice from oh, sure. the clone wars because he just had that echo uh, and stuff like that which i thought was pretty cool but yeah they, they clearly came from here now the one thing the other thing is is that the singing mountain clan had rancors and they were native to the planet dathmere that's something we didn't get in the clone wars though right and they're sentient too and they're able to be understood so tosh the one rancor that had the was her son she had two two calves so to speak and they Mm -hmm. were able to communicate with them and they were they actually kind of treated them as equals and that was one of the things that Isolder was kind of surprised about is he said you know you put your rancors above your men (laughs) kind of a thing so they were they were extremely prized in that way which was really cool to see but you know to your point about the kind of combination of the singing mountain clan with the actual night sisters from here is spot on because you know we see in the clone wars for example Saj Ventress and Mother Talzin and all of those sisters that have the very pale skin and they have like dark darker eyes you know and that type of thing and kind of the bony fingers but they have these incantation of spells and like you said in the magics but mm-hmm. yet they were a much more loyal and cohesive band like a tribe like the singing mountain clan. So they weren't a bunch of backstabbers, you know, they were always there to support each other and to make sure that, you know, what was good for one night sister was good for all. So there was definitely a lot of elements that, you know, as you said, kind of combine these two from, from this book to create what we know today as, you know, the, the night sisters of star Wars. Right. And you know, the, the night sisters and the current continuity are some offshoot of the Zabrak because, you know, that's yeah. what Darth Maul was and, uh, you know, uh, Savage Opress and, you know, their men lived in a completely different area than the Night Sisters did. And they would go pick out a mate and put them through all kinds of trials to prove that they are worthy of such an honor to be the champion for, for once like that. So, you know, some of those concepts were brought over, but then they were modified a little bit. And so that, right. so that's pretty cool. But, uh, you know, the other thing here is that we get a lot of uh, backstabbing that's going on, not just between the Hapens and the Night Sisters and the Singing Mountain Clan, but with uh, between the Night Sisters and Zinja there, mm-hmm. because the Night Sisters are feared. Then no one wants to let them off this planet. And the Singing Mountain Clan is like, you absolutely cannot let them get off here because they'll wreak havoc across the galaxy. And Luke starts to believe that through what he's experienced with the Force, and the Imperials know it too, and so. They had a prison on Dathomir, but the Night Sisters took it over. <laughs> they yeah. just kind of, they just kind of moved and took it over, and there wasn't really anything that the Empire thought they could do about that. And they just kind of left them there. They left their stormtroopers there under the command of these Night Sisters. They left the prisoners. They didn't care about the prisoners, which were all like political prisoners mm-hmm. uh, there in the prison. And Geth Zarian was the lead Night Sister there, but she was desperate to get off that world. And she and Zinja were working at opposite purposes where Zinja wanted Han Solo. And if you give me Han Solo, then I'll give you a ship and then you can fly off to some back corner of the galaxy. And so there's like, and then you'll never hear from us again. Well, neither one of them ever planned on honoring that deal. Right. And they tried to kill each other during the exchange. And when the Gazirian does get off the planet, Luke tricks Zinja into blowing up that ship. But you know, that was the other thing here is just kind of the added layer of intrigue that was in this novel. And I just thought that was incredibly well done as well. Oh, yeah, because there was so layered. And, mm. you know, the whole thing with that prison, as you said, they were these political prisoners that were basically just mm. ones that were a threat to the empire, but not enough of a threat that they, you know, wanted the Republic to end up with them either. 
And so I just thought that was really, especially the guy that was in the laundry mat that yeah. they came to this, this realization that, oh my gosh, like they're just basically forgetting about these people. So I think that was the whole point was that they didn't really care if the night sisters took it over. Cause it was almost like, okay, we can wash our hands of this now. But one thing, and, and I, I, I guess I never really understood this is what the heck did get Zurian think she was going to do once she got off Dathomir and where the heck did she think they were going to go? Yeah. I don't really know. You know, Zinja just gave them some coordinates and said, go there. Yeah. And I think that the idea was, you know, I, and I'm not sure why they were so desperate to get off Dathomir. They could have wiped out the Singing Mountain Clan had it not been for the interference of Luke and Han and company. Right. Uh, but yeah, but they, they wanted to get off and then they were going to do something. I don't know. They just want a different world or what the situation is, but there was no way they were going to stay in that corner. They were going to try and build power and conquer because she was power hungry when it came down right. to it. Right. So I got a question for you here about Leia. What did you think about her? And the spot she was put in, you know, because there's clearly been this romance that has existed since the Empire Strike Back. And then at the end, we saw it in the Return of the Jedi. It's, you know, she and Han are really realizing their love for each other. We even get a pseudo I love you, I know moment in this mm -hmm. book mm -hmm. later in the stages there. But she was willing to choose I Solar in all this and just kind of put her feelings for Han aside. What did you think about all that? Yeah, there was a few things about this that were a little unsettling, but I had to just say, okay, it's just, just take it at face value, Jay. It's just a story. Don't get yourself all worked up over it because I really did feel that it was kind of out of character for Leia to be so wishy-washy in this way. Mm -hmm. And it was also kind of out of character for Han to be so complacent and, you know, being the little homemaker, you know, on the ship and trying to make Leia all these dinners and then Leia being just so petty about yeah. everything. And then also the fact that I felt that Han was underestimating Leia in other ways too, because he was so protective of her and he didn't want her to go off by herself doing this or doing that or whatever. And I thought, did you remember seeing her doing all of the things that she did? Like, even killing Jabba the Hutt, Leia can take care of herself. You know, you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about that. Um, but yeah, her wishy-washiness was just kind of a little, little cringy for me. And I also have to say that I thought it was out of character that Han was willing to give up the Millennium Falcon so easily too. And yeah. that, that really bothered me. Cause I'm like, how, no, that's not, that's not Han. But how did you feel about all that? So I could appreciate Leia's predicament. She is the leader of the Alderanians. They were without a world. And so, you know, this idea was, you know, and she's got this Alderanian council that is pushing for this marriage because not only has it been the Republic, it benefits the Alderanians. They potentially get a new world out of all of this. And she was all about the rebel cause for so many years. And now it is, you know, how much good could she do with this political marriage if she engaged it. And so I can see why it would be something she would consider. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was just like, she got so angry with Han. And I did think some of Han's actions were a bit ridiculous. Here he is a Republic general. And yet he's just kind of doing some things that were childish and foolish along the way. And that whole kidnapping Leia thing that did not set well with me. I didn't think yeah. he'd do that at all. Uh -uh. And to just the, and then Leia, like you said, I think, you know, that description you gave of her on the Falcon when Han was trying to do everything he could to win her over, how petty she was being about it. And just like, you know, where's my food? No wine. You didn't give me the I right utensil. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have to cut my food. And so, you know, she was never going to let him sit down and eat with her. And it's just, it was just the wishy washy was right. You know, she kept going back and forth on that. So, you know, that part of it that did not appeal to me as well, but I could, I had some sympathy and some empathy for that plight that she was on, you know, which is like, what does she do? She follow her heart or does she do what's best for the Republic, best for her mm -hmm. people, best for the galaxy. And so, I don't know, I kind of had mixed feelings about that, but this leads me to my next question. Comparing this to the princess and the scoundrel, which story did you like better? Well, I like Princess and the Scoundrel mainly because it is more cohesive to their history as we know it. 
going forward. And I do think that it's a little bit more true to each of the characters and their value systems and the way that I, I could predict that they would actually act, you know what I mean? And, but this one is just a lot of fun adventure wise. And it's one of those stories that I feel like if you asked me in another 10 years to explain the plot of each one, this one would probably honestly lead me to remember the most details about it Mm -hmm. and intrigue me the most, even though I loved the princess and the scoundrel and I, I loved the, the entire, you know, the wedding and everything like that. And, and some of the intrigue and things in that. Yeah. I mean, this one really stands out in my memory and I think that's why I've revisited it so much, but how do you feel? So yeah, you brought up the wedding. It's what a few pages in this right. book, at the end mm-hmm. of the book, we don't even get like the whole ceremony. We just kind of get references to what Luke sees when he finally arrives at the wedding. That was the best part of the Princess and Scoundrel was the immediate aftermath from Return of the Jedi. Han finding Leia, them having that conversation. You know, he just basically says, "You know, I want you marry me," and she's like, "Yes." And the next thing you know, there's a bachelor party, with yeah. which the Ewoks crash. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the wedding and all the details that came with that wedding that dipped into all the Iranian culture that dipped into who Han and Leia were and, yes. and e- what the Ewoks traditions were. I thought that was fantastic, but that's like not even the first third of the book. The adventure that comes after that is fine, mm-hmm. it, but it's just fine. Right. Um, there were some cool things that happened on the Halcyon, which was the galactic star cruise. And I liked all that, but the whole ice planet, moon thing that that they stop at and you know the adventure they get there it's just kind of felt like the real story was the wedding and Mm -hmm. they could have left that at like a short story but they developed it into a novel uh from there this i think you use the right words this is a more fun adventure and so you know the cop out answer is i like the wedding better from the princess and the scoundrel but i liked the adventure here better i thought this was the, the better story and this i think has far more of an influence on things that are star wars not just in legends but you know, we already talked about the Night Sisters and where they came right. from and stuff like here. You know, we even get the Night Cloak, the Empire, dis, you know, disp- uh, oh, yeah. dispatches all these satellites across the atmosphere, which drown the sun. And basically, it's going to cause Dathomir to freeze and everything on it will die in a few days unless Zinja gets what he wants from uh, Gazerion. Well, that's like Operation Cinder Tech mm-hmm. that we've seen in the current continuity yep. right now. And so, this book had a lot more influence than I remembered having any of people writing on Rancor as well. We got to see that with Boba Fett in the book of Boba Fett. So this, this story planted a whole bunch of seeds all over the place. Oh yeah, definitely. As, as we are right now in star Wars history, looking back in retrospect, there's so much, you know, that, mm-hmm. that was drawn from this. So, you know, there's always a bit of truth in legends. There was a lot of truth in legends with this one, but you put it perfectly wedding better in the princess and the scoundrel story adventure better in this one. Although I think my favorite line is I like the way your pants fit. <laughs> 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 yeah. That cracked me up. I forgot that line. And I literally laughed out loud. I like the way your pants fit. Cause it totally reminded me of when they got back together in the force awakens, you know, it, you cut your hair, same jacket, you know, no, new jacket, you know, yeah. kind of a thing. It's like the same sort of, you know, banter back and forth between them. So that, that right there felt like home, you know, just that one little comment was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think about, um, Rel, who was that older witch in the singing mountain clan who had met Yoda, but then the first time she laid eyes on Luke and I sold her. It's like, you know, oh, Luke, you're that Jedi that's rebuilt the Jedi Order. And I sold her. You're the one that died here on Death Mirror. Yeah. What did you think about her and her like prophecies? Yeah, that was pretty chilling. And I just thought it was really cool because it was kind of bringing back the idea that Luke ended up saying that these are these are only one possibility. You know, mm-hmm. that, that it's kind of what Yoda said with visions when he was talking to Anakin, you know, that be careful when sensing the future. And it's a lot of it is, is the past that we take and, and the interpretations that we make from that. But, um, but she was a little creepy in some ways, you know, but then again, it fit very well just with the whole eclectic kind of feel of, of this book and the aesthetic that it was setting up with, the the night sisters and and the singing mountain clan i should say themselves 
Right. You know, the other thing that uh, occurred to me here is that, you know, this book was written in 1994 and the notion of what the Jedi Academy wasn't settled. We didn't have the prequels there. We didn't know that there was a Jedi temple on Coruscant and that's where they trained their younglings to become Padawans and eventually Jedi Knights and stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. Luke discovers over the course of this is that the Jedi Academy wasn't necessarily one place. The Jedi had the starships. And so their academy was in space right. and stuff like that, which was an interesting idea. And it's something that the legends kind of was all over the place on, you know, Luke was setting up an academy on Yavin four, and then he moved that to another world. And, you know, then they were constantly getting relocated. And then they tried to, you know, when um, Admiral Dalla took over the Republic, she tried to exile the Jedi altogether. And, you know, so they never couldn't sell anything. And this was a lot of this stuff came up before we had the prequels and we had an answer to that. But I did think it was interesting that, you know, he discovers the wreck of this old Jedi ship and he sees where like lightsabers were being made and he finds some old files and stuff like that. Well, it seemed like what was the name of the ship that Huang had where he would teach the Jedi younglings how to make their lightsabers? Oh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know how deliberate that was, but it did seem like an influence that may have carried forward. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, Yeah. I could totally see that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, starting around time, but uh, anything else that stood out to you from this novel that you want to bring up for discussion before we go? Well, again, you know, you were saying how this informed a lot of the things about the future, you know, of the new Jedi order. And and I, I love the, the little bit at the end where they go back to Rel and then, and, and even Luke then says, you will have a daughter between ice older and ten, and Tenennial Joe, you will have a daughter that will be trained by Luke, you know, kind of a thing and seeing these, these things for the future. And it's like, Oh yeah, this is Tenel Ka, you know, kind of yeah. thing. Um, and then there was some really fun little, kind of humorous things in here too and you put this in our notes the whole kiss my wookie thing mm-hmm. that is so i could see that that's so hot and then then chewy just laughing about it like crazy like he's just playing right into that so i was surprised though at the um amicable relationship between han and 3po in this in that han was very concerned for 3po's welfare in a lot of ways where normally he would just be like, all right, you know, Mr. Professor, although at one point he calls him Mr. Verbo Brain or something like yeah. that. When 3 po is like, I have these da, 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 kind of brains. He's like, all right, Mr. Verbo Brain. But anyways, yeah, I'm all over the place on that. But those are just some little quick hits of some things that were in my brain pan at the time. But what about you? Yeah, we, we've hit most of my my thoughts on this. Uh, you know, there's some really, um, really great action scenes in this book, you know, in the Night Sisters attack. And then the Singing Mountain Clan goes on the counteroffensive there, and you've got the you know, some of the witches on the back of the Rancors attacking the the Night Sisters, and the Night Sisters basically have these stormtroopers as thralls, and they also have the ATSTs, the Scout Walkers, out there. Mm-hmm. And so the Rancor is going to battle against them. There's some pretty cool action scenes there. It, it was a very, very clever book. Uh, I. I'm glad we read it again. This was fun. Uh, you know, this is something that you and I both kind of had to cram into our schedule and get read in a much shorter time than what we usually do when it comes to preparing to have a discussion about a Star Wars novel. But yeah, I'm glad we did it because it, it, I did not remember how much I enjoyed this book. I, of course, remembered reading. I think I'd read it twice before this, but getting through this and just it just like I said earlier, brought back so many fond legends memories there and from this completely different era of star Wars, that's now fallen to the wayside. Uh, you know, that's, it's been over 10 years since legends got, you know, since what's now legends got set aside and, you know, it was hard to take back at the time, but now it's just kind of like, Oh yeah, these legend stories, they were fun, but I don't think about them nearly as much because we have this like really huge volume of continuity books and novel Mm -hmm. stuff now. So it's true. It's true. It was, it was great to revisit a lot of nostalgia and it, it is really kind of a quick read and the audio version with January Lavoie is a lot of fun Mm -hmm. and she does a really great job of doing the, the voices and, and bringing all of this to life. So I'm, I'm glad that that is available to consume in that way as well. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. Well, cool. I'm glad we got to do this. This was a lot of fun. Uh, And so it was a, 
fun story to read for Valentine's Day. Not the most romantic thing we could have come up with, but hey, it works. So with that, just want to say thanks for joining us for this episode of Podcast Stardust and our discussion of The Courtship of Princess Leia. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you want to get our take on lots of other Star Wars books, then make sure you subscribe to Podcast Stardust and you'll get all of our future uh, novel and literary discussions downloaded when they come out. Like the like, also like to remind you that you can find all episodes of the podcast over on richardsapp.com, which is also home to several other great podcasts covering everything from the MCU and DC to Dune, Star Trek, and a whole lot more. We always appreciate your five-star ratings and reviews on whatever pie catcher is that you use. And we love it when you share the show with uh, your friends on social media. So with that in mind, Jay, you want to remind everybody what those social media contacts are and where else we can be found around the internet. Oh, yeah. You love us. We know. And you can let us know over on Facebook, Instagram, and X or Twitter at Podcast Stardust. And we do have a bunch of other places that you can connect with us. You can check out our Pinterest boards and our YouTube channel, which does have all of our past episodes. And we are now on YouTube Music as well. So head over to both of those, like and subscribe. And I know a lot of people are really using the Spotify thing right now, too. And we do have reviews over there. So I just really appreciate all of the ways that everyone has been sharing the show. Show. And if you'd like to connect with us in real time, you can do that over on our Discord room, which is part of the RetroZap Discord server. And we also have a Tee Public store, and the link to that is in our show notes. And you can support us by picking up one of seven different podcast Stardust logo designs on everything from apparel to home goods and literally everything in between. And we are now partnering with Saber Masters. So if you are an aspiring Jedi or maybe on the dark side of the Force, you're going to need a lightsaber. And and so we are pleased to partner with them and you can check out all of our different are there are different types of lightsabers over on their website, which is sabermasters.com. And we do have a discount code and all you have to do at checkout is just type in Stardust and the link to that will be in our show notes. So with that, Dennis, why don't you go ahead and fill everybody in on some other fun things you've got going on past, present and future. So my wife and I are counting down the days to the debut of season five of Discovery, which we'll be covering on our Star Trek podcast, which is known as War Trails. That podcast is exclusive to the Retro Zap podcast feed. So just head to your podcast of choice, look for the Retro Zap feed, and you'll find all of our upcoming episodes there. If you want to find our past discussions of Discovery, Strange New Worlds, Lower Decks, and Picard, then the best place to do that is to head over to RetroZap.com. Jay, what do you got going on in cosplay? All right. Well, as always, you can catch me over on my Instagram, which is at j.snipscosplay. And I am always over there as Ahsoka and Hera and the fourth sister from the Kenobi series, as well as my upcoming original concept Mandalorian, which is based on another Legends character known as Tahiri Vela, my very favorite of all time. And so again, just check that out at j.snipscosplay. Okay, upcoming on the show this Friday, it'll be another edition of Star Wars News. And then on Monday, we're doing something really fun. We're going into the Star Wars version of What If with a discussion of Star Wars Infinity's A New Hope from Dark Horse Comics. So thanks for listening to episode 690 of Podcast Stardust, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. And until next time, may the Force be with you.